it's not pleasant. Because when people are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit, they're not sensitive to the Word. So that we're a church that we want to be sensitive to God moving in our midst. So when the Word comes forth, we're ready to receive it. Praise the Lord. But before I get into the message, I, I just want to make a, a, a aware of something. Today at 1 o'clock, I'm having both of our other pastors, the pastor uh, from Chalmette, uh, brother, uh, Pastor Chris Rodriguez is going to be here, and then our pastor from the Covington Church, uh, Pastor David Lukinovich is going to be here, and we're going to be speaking to our leaders on the direction that we will be taking this church come July. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you want to hear it firsthand, then come back here at 1 o'clock. If not, you're going to hear it secondhand. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. We were just going to do this with the leaders, but I felt the Lord would want me to have everybody here to hear what we have to say concerning this ministry. If this is your church, if this is where you want to be, then you need to know where we're going. So uh, I invite you, okay? Don't, don't say nobody told me or, or we didn't hear, uh, but I'd rather you hear it uh, firsthand instead of secondhand because sometimes secondhand and thirdhand, it gets a little mixed up. So uh, I just want to offer that invitation to you. They will be driving from their churches. That's why we had to do it at one to give them time to get here. So. Well, praise the Lord. I'm excited. This church is doing something, and we're going somewhere. So you need to know, if, if you're on this bus, you need to know where it's going. <laughs> praise the Lord. Well, we're going to continue in our series on what it means to be a Christian. This is the fourth leg of our five-part series. Next week, we're going to conclude it, and I hope you'll have an understanding of what being a Christian is all about. So I want to cover just briefly some of the things that we covered so far. We realize that the Christian life has significance simply because this is not a religion. People in the world said, well, they had religions before Christianity. No, they didn't. The Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. God already had this in his mind before Man was even created, God made provision for us. Then the second thing is that the Christian faith exists because of the failure of man. How many know that we were all failures without God? We weren't going anywhere, making all the wrong moves, the wrong uh, decisions in our life because we didn't obey God. So there's a reason why Christianity exists is because of the failure of man to obey God. Then last week we covered what actually happens when we become a Christian. Well, we know that when you're born again of the Spirit of the living God, it's not joining a church, but it's having an experience with God. You become saved, and all of a sudden you have the ability to commune with God. We can talk with God. We can hear from God. We can sense His presence as we did just in the worship service, we can know God. You didn't know God before. You didn't have the capability of knowing God. So Christianity is when man has an opportunity now to know who his God is and be able to hear from his God, pray to his God, commune with his God, and to be able to have hope in his God. So today we're going to look at the divine purpose. One of the greatest aspects of Christianity when you become a born-again Christian is that you realize now that your life has a purpose. Have you ever wondered before you came to Christ, what in the world am I doing here? I used to think about that all the time. Why am I facing all these problems? What in the world am I doing here? Where are we going? I didn't ask to come here. Did you? You just found yourself alive, and you were here. 
facing a world you didn't know anything about. So you didn't know what your purpose was until you meet the real God, the living God, then you realize God made me for a time like this, for this time. So we understand that there's a greater purpose for our existence. When I got saved, I realized I got a greater purpose for being alive than I was just out there in the world living for myself, trying to grab all the gusto the world has and not knowing what it all means. It's very important as a Christian to know what our purpose is and how we need to be alive to that fact every day of our life, that God has a purpose for me. God has a purpose for you. It might, it's all the same purpose, but God's got us in different places doing different things to fulfill his purpose. Born-again Christians are governed by that purpose. That's what should govern each and every one of us. There's a familiar verse relating to purpose that I live by. My wife lives by it. We've been living by it for over 50 years now. And uh, every time we face hard decisions and, and hard situations in our life and things come up in life that you don't expect, we always say all things. Oh, we keep reminding each other of all things because in Romans 8, 28, it says this. Uh, Paul says, and we know that in all things, say all things. Okay, just get that out. All things. You know what all things mean? Good things, bad things, and otherwise. All things, okay? God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to whose purpose? His purpose, not our purpose. See, things don't work out for our purpose. Things work out for his purpose, according to his purpose, okay? Now, it's his purpose, which means, which means that all things are working together for his purpose, which means our aspirations in life, everything you dreamed about, is secondary to his purpose. When God called me in the ministry, I think I was saved probably about seven years. God raised me up in my profession that I was in as a cosmetologist. I was a part owner of two beauty schools, making a lot of money, doing everything I ever dreamed about doing in my profession. And then he called me to go into the ministry. I had to cut it all loose. and uh, But I realized that his purpose was more important than my purpose. And I want you to understand that whatever you dream up in this life and whatever you think you're going to get out of this life, his purpose is greater than yours. Okay? And, uh, and his purpose means that he's number one. We're number two. Okay? His work, he'll work all things out. You know, the, the, the devil has deceived people in the world by misquoting this verse we just read. The, the devil tells people that everything's going to work out for the good. Guess what? It don't. It don't work out for the good of unbelievers. It's only for us. See, it's only for us, those who love him and have been called according to his purpose, then everything is going to work out for our good that we might fulfill his purpose. That's how it works. So the, the unbelievers out there, when I hear them say that, they, they say, you know, everything works out for the good. I say, no, it doesn't. Not for the unbeliever, it don't work out good. It works out bad many times. So let me mention a couple more verses, that, and there's a multitude of them in the Word of God concerning God's purpose. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. See, God called us because he wants us to fulfill his plan. We all have a part in his plan. I never knew it was I was going to be a preacher. I had no idea of that. 
preaching from this pulpit when I first got saved was telling me I'm going to land on Mars one day. It just didn't happen. But I want to tell you something. God's plan is better than, than any plan that we have. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul says, Now it is God who has made us for his very purpose, given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I love that part where it says he gives us his Spirit as a deposit. Once the Holy Spirit got in me, I knew, hey, I'm headed somewhere. I, I'm headed somewhere. Because the, 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 the Spirit of God is in me. Hallelujah. 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul says, Who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. See, the purpose, his purpose, he has for us. So as a believer, we have a purpose. You're not just existing here. We're not saved just to be saved. We're not a Christian just to be a Christian. We're not a Christian just to have some kind of religion. No, being born again is, the, is just the beginning. It's just the beginning of what God has called us for his purpose. That's just the beginning. So we can look through the Bible. There's many things that point to his purpose. So what is his purpose? This is what I want you to understand. But there's one verse that includes all of it. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's God's purpose, that we might have the fullness of Christ. See, uh, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So God's intention for us and purpose for us is to have the fullness of Christ. That's why we are here. He wants us to attain the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is God's divine purpose for Christians. I don't care whether you're a preacher. I don't care what you do in life in that position God has called you to. He wants you to attain fullness. He wants you to be fulfilled in that place that God has you. So obviously, that is something that is progressive. It's a progressive thing. We don't get all the fullness at one time. You can't handle it. You couldn't handle it. You, you, it's a progressive thing. No Christian at any time in all of history has attained the full measure of Christ here. We need to be progressing to it, but we don't have it all yet. We don't, I've been 52 years now in Christianity. I, I don't have it all yet. That means the Christian life is a process that, we, that God is working out in us. He's working it out. What is he working out to? That we might obtain the fullness. See, we've got to keep getting full. It's all moving towards that ultimate goal is to have the fullness of Christ. John says this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, but what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, we're going to reach that point of the fullness of Christ where we're going to be able to see Christ as he is. Why? Because we're going to be like him. That's God's purpose. We shall be like him. That's the final stage of Christianity, is to be like Christ. The fullness of Christ. What does it mean? It can only mean one thing. What is the fullness? You say, well, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's fine. You need to be full of the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need to be full of God's Holy Spirit. But what does it mean, the fullness of Christ? It can only mean his character. 
His character. Who is he? Who is he? Whatever resembles Christ, we got to be full of it. Whatever Christ is, we must be full of it. Well, it's the nature of Christ, and it can be summed up in four L's. Life, light, liberty, and love. Now, the first is life. We're talking about a new life. That's when we become born again. That's when you become a Christian. You have a new life, which is a different life. And that's the experience we talked about last week. But everything becomes new now. Your whole world looks different. Everything looks different. That's the experience when you're born again. And we're not just talking about the way we live. You want me to tell you something? They got some unbelievers out there living better lives than than professing Christians. It's not the way we live. I'm talking about a dynamic power that comes in us. It's divine life. It's eternal life. It's something that, that empowers us to be able to live like Christ lived. It's another nature. It's a totally different nature, which is divine and it's eternal. It's another dimension. I realized when I got saved and God's Holy Spirit came in me, he changed my life. I realized that the life that he has given me don't fit here no more. Don't fit here. It's like I feel like I'm a stranger here now. I must, I must fit somewhere else. Yes, I do. I fit in the presence of God. I fit around the throne of God. That's where this life that I have now is headed. Right now, I don't really fit here. You shouldn't fit here. If you're fitting in with that world out there, you're in trouble. God calls us out of that. So it's a realm that it's God himself, eternal life. It's when we're connected to God, we're not connected to this world anymore. You know, we're in this world, but the Bible said we're not of this world. I'm not here no more. I'm out. I'm a castaway from this world. Christians should be conscious of this nature that is at work in us and is changing us. See, Christians ought to be changing every day. Every day, you ought to be changing. And and, uh, uh, in prayer today, uh, Nick Fury was saying how, how he never used to like to read the Word. Now he's reading the Word. He can't get enough of it. (laughs) <laughs> that's change he wasn't him before it wasn't like him before now he's reading the word he can't get enough of it unbelievers don't want to do that they don't want to take the bible i don't want to read no bible hey you get saved you get god's word you can't get enough of it you can't get it you can't get enough of it and that changing that that spirit that's at work with us is working with some things and against some things there's some things in your life that spirit is working against. You got you to get rid of that. You can't do that no more. Have you ever had the Holy Spirit tell you that? You can't go there no more. Forget about that. Cut that out. That doesn't resemble Christ at all. The Bible calls this sanctification. Calls it purification. We're being set apart. I don't fit with this world. I don't look like this world. I don't act like this world. I'm being changed every day. This is the new nature conquering that old sinful nature. You start cutting that stuff loose. You know, I I had people tell me, well, you don't do this anymore. You don't drink this. You don't do that. No, I don't do it. I don't do it. I don't want to do it. See, I don't want to do it. People say, do I have to give up smoking dope? Do I have to give up drinking? Do I have to give up this? Do I have to give up that? I say, no, you don't have to give up anything. Just come to Christ and you'll give it up. You'll throw it away because you ain't going to want it anymore. See, that's sanctification. That's having the fullness of Christ. Getting rid of the trash. Getting rid of the trash in your life and get the fullness of Christ. The second thing is light. John 8, 12, Jesus said, when when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. See, now we are light. Jesus said, we're the light of the world now. He's gone. We're the light of the world. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter says, A people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light, his wonderful light. I'll never forget that, that night when I got saved at Lakeview Christian Center, 232 Veterans Highway. I left that church at night. I looked going down Veterans Highway, all those bar rooms and joints I used to hang in, and I could see them just like they are. I said, ain't never going back there again. Every one of them that I used to hang in, I said, ain't going there no more. See, all of a sudden, it was like God lit up Veterans Highway. He lit it up where I could see it, just like it is. See, we are people of the light, not darkness. We have a clear vision now of things in our life, where before we were walking like we were blindfolded, walking anywhere, doing anything. Another world has been opened up to us. It was like we were blind, like amazing grace. I was once blind, but now I see. See? So we're given a new world to live in. This world looks different. It, do, it doesn't look like it looked before. When I, I used to see it before, I wanted everything. Now I don't want anything. I was telling my wife on the way here, God has blessed us the cars, houses. I told her, I said, you know something? All this can go. I'm all right. <laughs> I'm all right. It can all go. It's all right. Hey, Katrina took it all at one time. We've lost everything. Hey, I'm still back. He looked like he gave me more. But it can go again. It really doesn't matter. So we got, so we got uh, a life. We got light. The third thing is liberty. See, we've been, we've been released and we're broken out of a box we were in. We were held captive in our life. It's, a, it's, it's the small world of selfishness and self-centeredness. God breaks us out of that. See, that's what, you know, there's something wrong with, with, with a Christian life that is small. See, that's where religion comes in. Religion keeps you small, keeps you in parameters. This is where all you got to do is this. and You're going to be okay. No, that's not it. You're held in a box. That's what religion is. Religion's mean. Did you know that? Religion's mean. It's limited. It's petty. It's narrow. But I want to tell you something. This new life in Christ is huge. It's huge. It's huge. It, we're, it's a large thing. It's like being in a land that, that there's no barriers. We're wide open. We've got everything. We're like a city without walls. There's no limit to us now. Why? Because the spirit that's living in us has no limits. There's no limits on the spirit that is living in us. And the further you go in the Christian life, the more conscious you become how much more there is. See, religion, people get satisfied. Well, I've done everything. I've done everything. I'm good. No, you ain't done nothing. <laughs> When you become a Christian, you realize all that God has brought to me, all that I am, there's so much more. That's why we're free here. We want everything God has for us. We want all the gifts of the Holy Spirit here. We want everything God has for us. We want it, and we don't want to be put in a box. We want to be free to receive from God. And you'll never get it all here. But that is no excuse why we have to settle for anything. 
We don't have to become stagnated that this is the way it is. No, it's not. There's much more. No growth, no advancement. No, we're going to keep rolling. We can never exhaust this wonderful life of promise, a future, and a vast and wide open door. The door has been open for us. The doors of heaven has been open for us. Everything is ours as a believer. The fourth L is love. Paul said in Romans 5, 5, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Love is the hallmark of true Christian life. It's the very start of it. I don't know about you, but it shows at the very start there's an instantaneous, instantaneous desire to share this life with somebody. As soon as you get saved, you want to go tell somebody, right? That's the love of God being poured out in your heart that, that I can't keep this to myself now. I got to go tell somebody. That's the love of God. You wouldn't do that before. Your greedy, selfish self. If you got something, you keep it to yourself. No, you can't. Because it's the love of God now. You want everybody saved. You want everybody to experience something so, so fantastic as being born again. You want everybody to know it. It's a great overflow of the heart. It's God's love being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's why I don't understand why Christians really don't share their faith. They don't. It's not just us for no more. No, God has given us love that's got to be poured out. You know, it's like you will do anything God has you to do. You'll do anything. I've done it. You'll make any sacrifice. You'll never consider yourself when God says do something, you're going to do it. It's a character of selfless love. Self is put away. You got to put your own self out the way. If you want the fullness of Christ to live in you, get self out the way. Get it out the way. Now, some of all these things are elementary form right from the beginning, but I want to tell you it's going to expand. It's going to grow. Things I'm doing now, I could have never done in before, but it's because I left myself open. And it would was probably 20 years ago, I got out of a denomination that we were in because I felt I was in a box. I, I saw that there was so much more in Christianity than to go through a, a religious uh, structure that was there when I got there. I didn't know any different, but God showed me that there's so much more. I, I don't know if there's anybody here that remember that day uh, when I was in Chalmette, church was big, but I said, no, I, I got to get out of this religious thing here, you know, the way we do things. I jumped in the baptismal tank, had one of my men baptize me again. I told, told my church, I said, I'm not in here because I'm in sin. I'm in here because I'm repenting of religion. <laughs> I said, put me down. I'm coming up. And I want to tell you, Things changed. Not only I, I got in there, I had choir members in back and choir robes jumping in. We we going too. We don't want religion no more. And since then, that church took off. We packed the house, six hundred people. The move of God began to move by His Holy Spirit because we got out of the box. Ain't gonna be no box here. No box. I don't know where we going, but ain't we gonna be in no box? The walls are down. We're going where God's telling us to go. So there are some principles that governs the Christian life, and they are important for us if we're going to reach fullness. We've got to recognize these principles because apart from them, you will never realize your fullness and your purpose. The greatest thing in life is to be called according to his purpose. That's it. You can't be a Christian and go do your own thing. You got to be a Christian and do 
God's purpose for your life. We need to know the principles governing our purpose. The first and foremost is the principle of the cross. Everything we preach, everything we teach, it's got to emanate from there. You can't preach this without the cross. So the cross is the first principle that we're going to reach our fullness. And the cross has two sides. The first one is outwardly what it means to us. What does that cross mean to us? And second of all, what does it mean in us? In other words, what is it doing in us? I know what it means to me, but what does it mean in me? The cross on one side is a finished work. Fully and finally done. Can do nothing else. There is nothing else. There's no other sacrifice God's going to make. This is the end of the line here. The last words Jesus said on the cross was, it is finished. It's finished. <laughs> I wonder how that looks. I wonder how God looks at us through the finished work of the cross. You know, what he, know, you know how he looks at us? He, the Bible says we're a dead man. You're a dead woman. You're dead. That's how God looks at us through the cross. You, because he says when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Okay? That's what it says. And uh, we're now a new creation. Until we see that, we'll never get anywhere. We must accept this ultimate position. As God's verdict. That's God's verdict. See, when we accept this and we become born again, that's God's verdict. We're not dead anymore. We're alive. See, and that is what begins to work in us. It just so happens that when he said it is finished, that the veil in the temple was split from top to bottom. You know, that was <laughs> the Jewish people couldn't go in the presence of God. They had to stay outside. They had a veil separated. Well, I want to tell you something. Since the cross came, that veil is torn. That means it's wide open. You as a believer, me as a believer, I can enter into the presence of God. I can come boldly before the throne of God. I can come boldly. Why? Because of the cross. Showing that the way of God is open now, through faith and the cross. So that side of the cross is finished. Ain't nothing can be done there. But what is the cross doing inside of me? Well, let's remember the progression we looked at earlier as a Christian's life is in, a, in progress. We got the past, right? You got your past life, Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That's salvation. That's being born again. That's how the progression starts. Then we got the present right now. What is the cross doing in us right now? The present is 2 Corinthians 4.10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. See, that's what we're doing. That's what the cross is doing right now. We're carrying it around in us every day of our life knowing that Jesus died for this sinful man. Which is sanctification. If you walking around with the cross every day, you're going to be sanctified. You're not going to want to touch anything in this world. See, we're being saved. We're carrying our cross. This is what Jesus said. <laughs> You want to be my disciple? Pick up your cross and follow me. You got to have the cross with you every day of your life, every minute of your life. Every decision you make needs to be with the cross in mind. Then we got the future. Paul says in Philippians 3, 10 and 11, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's complete salvation. That's, that's the end of the line there. When we're resurrected, that is it. So what is God doing with us? Well, you might say, well, why is all this trouble I'm in, this difficulty? 
this discipline, this school of hard knocks, what is all that about? Well, I thought the Christian life was going to be a continuous song and dance. I thought it was going to be a picnic. I thought it was going to be a joy rock. I thought things were going to be different. Life was going to be easier. All right, things are going to be, remember the fullness of Christ is his character. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. If you don't have the character, you don't have hope. See, it's when we begin to put on the character of Christ, how does it come? Paul said it comes through our suffering. You're not going to know what it is unless we have some kind of suffering. That's why back in the 80s when these preachers were preaching this positive confession thing and, and the get rich quick thing and uh, you give $100 to their ministry, God's going to make you rich and, and you never have to worry about anything. You get sick, just don't confess it, don't do anything. Life is great. No, life is not great. We're going to face the same things unbelievers face. We're going to go through the same things unbelievers go through. Christians will face the same thing. The only difference is the results are going to be different. The suffering of Christians produces character of Christ. Whereas the, we're going to have the fruit of his nature. Suffering brings out the character of Christ in us. So quit complaining. Quit murmuring. God hates murmuring. Oh, why am I going through this? Oh, what guy? I... Hey, all things, all things are working. I don't care what it is, how hard it is. We've been through it. My wife and I have been through it. We've faced it. But guess what? All things. To the unbeliever, these, the suffering and everything brings out bitterness and resentment. Turn, they turn against God. They blame God. They become bitter, become sour, but not to the believer. We shouldn't become bitter and sour because we're facing something. I like that song Andre Krauss used to sing, if I never had a problem, I'd never know God could solve it. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? So, hey, I got a problem. I, I began, when I started maturing in Christ, I began realizing, oh, I got a problem coming. Let me see how God's going to get me out of this. Let me see. I'm going to stay in faith. I'm going to believe him. No matter how bad it looks, he's going to get me out of here. And guess what? Every time, every time, if he doesn't, then he's not the God that we serve. So the principles of the cross is at work in us, clearing the ground. So some of that suffering, we're clearing stuff out. You know, in every trial and every tribulation, when you go through it and God gets you, you change. You change. Changes you. Stuff like that changes us. And it should change us into the character of Christ. The next thing, the second thing, there's a principle of relatedness. And this is a very important principle and many Christians don't have a clue about this, no Christian could ever reach the fullness of Christ alone. You can't do it alone. Many Christians think they can make it without being related to the body of Christ, which is the church. They say, oh, I don't have to go there. I don't have to be there. I'll just read my Bible. Stay at home. Worship at home listen to the preacher on television, and I'm good. No, you're not good. You'll never reach the fullness of Christ being separated from the body of Christ. Never. You won't do it. It's like any part of your body. You cut your hand off, see what happens to it. If you don't connect it, it's not connected to the body. It's never going to fulfill its purpose. 
We need all our parts to be connected together. They got to be connected. No member can develop without being a part of the whole body. So the first thing Christians got to realize is that we belong to each other. You say, well, I don't, I don't get along with everybody. That's fine. That's fine, but you still need them. You don't have to get along with them. You still need them. But we can't reach the fullness without each other. See, we must be related to one another. Our spiritual life depends on our relatedness. We've got to be together. And it's the secret of our spiritual growth. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, no, so one man sharpens another. You say, well, I don't like that person. Like, I can't, I can't, I don't, their personality, I can't take it. Listen, you got to get around them because their personality is going to do something to you. <laughs> it's it's going to make you like them. See, <laughs> I don't have to like the way everybody talks. People don't like the way I talk. That's fine. But, hey, you still need me. I need you. We need each other. If I'm going to be what God wants me to be, I need you. We need to, to, to be related together. It's the secret to our spiritual growth. If that's the secret, now think about it. If that's the secret of us being connected and related, then the devil's scheme is what? There you go. That's why we need each other. That's why we need each other. Because separated, the devil is the devil's scheme. It causes division and separation. Divisions are the masterpiece of the devil. That He loves it. If he could get us separated, if he could get us quarreling, if he could get us uh, 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 having things against each other, then he's done his work. Listen, I've been in, I've been in, uh, I've been pastored four churches now. Three of them I started. This is the last one that I started. And guess what? We had trouble in all of them. People said, I, I, well, I want to go find a better church. Let me tell you something. If you find a perfect church, don't go in there. As soon as you go in there, it ain't perfect no more. Stay away from it. Leave it alone. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. I'm going to tell on my wife a little bit. The first church, first church we pioneered, I mean, we, we didn't know nothing. We was new pastors, new young, new pastors, and you have trouble. You know, so, Say, so right, what people, what's wrong with people? And she says, one day we was at home, she said, I think we got a, a church full of nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and the Holy Spirit came on me, and I said, baby, if they were all right, they wouldn't need us. God has called us to reach the nuts. God wants to make some peanut butter out of them, you know what I mean? So don't complain when we have trouble in the church. I said, you're going to have that. We're going to have people, listen, we got people sitting here like myself and, and, and uh, Brother Chris back there, some of us. We've been saved for decades. We start reaching people out, out there in the world. And they come in, they don't know their head from nothing. They don't, they don't know how to talk. They don't know how to walk. They don't know how to get along with people. They don't know anything. But we got to save them. We got to bring them in. They'll get better. They'll get better. But when they look at that, you say, whoa, look at these people. What kind of church is this? You hear one of them cursing or doing whatever they're doing. You say, what kind of church is this? No, well, they just came off the street. But we need them. That's why. That's why I love our life groups. 
see the life groups is where we learn to live together. We learn to enjoy life together. That's why we need those groups. That's why they're so important. It, our fellowship is essential. That's why we need the life groups. I absolutely love our life groups. I get encouraged every time we meet. This is not artificial. I mean, we, we don't just go there. We love going there. My brother Norman, brother Scott, don't you love going there with the guys? I love it. I, I, I want to be there. See, that's that's the... That, that's the, this is not artificial. This is organic. It's the life and love of a Christian that makes us want to be together. It's not something on the outside. It's not legalistic. No, it's something on the inside that makes me want to be around you. It comes from Christ within us. It makes us want to be together. There, there are evil forces that are set up against this matter of fellowship, want to keep us from fellowshipping. I like this church. This reminds me of the first church we pioneered. We had a lot of fellowship going on. We've been getting together, and we do it. We do as much as we can to, to get together and to, and to be around one another. Then the third principle is the purity of heart. This is a principle that without it, you'll never increase to the fullness of Christ. You'll not grow in Christ. We've got to maintain a pure heart and a right spirit. The psalmist David wrote, Psalm 51, after he committed adultery with Bathsheba, killed her husband, and he was a mess. He was out, he, he was out there. He wrote that psalm. There's more to it than this verse. But in that psalm, he says, tells the Lord, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, Lord, change my heart. See, it was his heart. He had a heart problem. That's why he went with Bathsheba. That's why he didn't think of anything of killing a husband after he impregnated the woman. He didn't think it was anything. Just go kill a husband. Everything will be all right. No, everything's not all right. But David knew what his problem was and what he needed God to do for him. He said, Lord, created me a pure heart now. My heart was bad. And let me tell you something. A lot of problems Christians have, their heart goes bad. Your heart is bad. That's why you do the things you do. The psalmist was asking the Lord to open his heart and free him. Free him from prejudice. Free him from wrong attitudes of the heart. See, a pure heart is one that has the ability to change and to adjust. You will never change unless your heart is pure. When your heart gets hard, that's it. It's the end. It ain't going nowhere. It's going to stay hard. But when our heart is pure and we're steadfast, when God says something, we take it and we do it and it changes us. So even though there's prejudices and attitudes, maybe you were brought up with all your life, you just can't shake it. Just, just God will give you a pure heart and you can deal with those things and you can conform to God's word. So if the Lord shows us a little light and truth, if your heart is pure, you're going to take it. You're not going to rebel against it. You're going to take it. Say, God, I hear you. I'll take that. See, a pure heart and a steadfast spirit will make us wide open to receive from the fullness of God. It is through purity of hearts that we receive the fullness of Christ. This is God's divine purpose for us. Pure heart. See, we've got a pure heart and God can fill us to fullness. Hallelujah. Stand with me right now.